We are exploring uh, through a series the idea of getting to know the GC or the General Conference. I have with me uh, today Mark Finley, Pastor Finley. How are you going today? I'm doing well. I'm thanking the Lord that it's another good day. Great. So we have a few questions for you. Um, they're just, I guess, we know you as somebody who's an author, um, a pastor, an evangelist. We also just want to get to know you a little bit um, and your journey. So I'm going to ask the first question to get us started. And it's actually, I find it's it's a possibly a very long question um, to answer. But the question is, um, tell us about your early life and if you've always been an Adventist. Sure, Ruth. I was brought up in a lovely Roman Catholic home. My mother was a Catholic. My father was a Protestant, actually, but my father made an agreement with my mother that when the children were young, he would allow them to go to the Catholic Church and we'd be brought Catholic. So we were. When I was 17 years old, dad began to share Jesus with me and in a new way, a fresh way. I felt a new peace and a joy in my life that I hadn't felt before. And God moved in some special ways. And so at 17, I became a Seventh-day Adventist. I want to hasten to add, though, that my father had been a Protestant. We married my mother and later became a Seventh-day Adventist. But I never saw my father and mother argue once over religion. My mother didn't drive. My father did. My father would drive my mother to Catholic church on Sunday morning, sit in the car studying his Adventist Sabbath school lesson while she went to church. Deep respect. I, I can remember this Ruth in our home. Easter time came. Mom would fix this wonderful, well, not so wonderful today, but we thought it was <laughs> beautiful ham. And uh, mm. we put ham and mashed potatoes and salad and corn and peas. My father would fill his plate with mashed potatoes, salad, corn, peas, pass the ham by and say to my mother, what a beautiful meal. My mother smoked. My father did not. It was when I looked at my background in my home, I saw my father lovingly reaching out to mom, demonstrating by example what Christ-like living was. He was not a perfect man, but he was a godly man. And uh, there was in my life when my grandmother died, and that was an opening, and my father shared Christ with her, and mom became a Seventh-day Adventist. I had become an Adventist before, so it was 17 years old when I became an Adventist. Wow. And it just sounds like you've had this experience that I would argue a lot of people don't get to have with that, that deep sense of respect. And um, I mean, you think about Catholicism and, and Adventism being seen in the world as possibly the most opposite forms of Christian faith. And here you are within your own house having this deep sense of respect and um, appreciation and love for one another modeled to you. Um, and I have a feeling that that's actually impacted your own call to ministry and your walk in it. It impacted me greatly. I recognized right away that although God has an ideal in marriage and in life, many people don't meet that ideal ultimately. We live in a very real world. And to be able to relate to one another, and I learned also from my father that um, there was a time when he knew that he had to witness very strongly to my mother, not only by his lifestyle, but by sharing biblical truth. And what had happened is my grandmother was like a two pack a day smoker and she eventually died of lung cancer. And I remember when my mother came home, I was at home and she came home that day just crying and crying and said, she's gone. My father came home from work and I didn't know what happened until years later, but he went into the room with my mother, put his arms around her and uh, she cried and said, you know, mother suffered so much with cancer, but now she's suffering in purgatory. And my father said to her, Gloria, said very little to you because I didn't want to offend you, but let me share with you the truth about death. And he shared about the beautiful peace and the sleep of death and that her grandmother, my grandmother wasn't in purgatory, burning between heaven and hell suffering. My mother was greatly comforted with that. That was like on a Tuesday or Wednesday, Ruth. And then... On Sabbath, my mother got up, took a shower, put her best dress on, fixed her hair. And my father said, well, where are you going today? And she said, I'm going to church with you. And he was the local mm. church, walked in with my mother on her arm that, um, that day. And, you know, people were weeping because it was such a moving experience. And she didn't miss Sabbath after that. Uh, she, it was at that moment in her life when she was open. And, you know, John Wesley calls that provenient grace. He says that in everybody's life, 
there's going to be a time of openness and receptivity. So when I'm counseling with people like who have teenagers who maybe are on rebelling or they, they're not interested in church, I say to them, look, demonstrate Christ in your lifestyle. And uh, when you do that, watch the way God works. I remember I was 17 years old or and, and I was playing on a basketball team and uh, and uh, we were a very good team, but we had nobody that would coach us. We just argued and argued and we lost four games in a row and we were zero and four and it came in the newspaper, you know, this team and we were so embarrassed. And I came home and said to my father, you know, dad, I'm so embarrassed and we lost four games in a row. And dad said to me, well, who's your coach? I said, nobody will coach us. Now you have to understand my interest in sports, none, but he knew boy. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'll coach you. And he began coaching us and we qualified as the last place for the major city tournament. It was on a Friday night. Wow. And dad said to me, Mark, you know, I'm a seventh day Adventist and I, uh, I will not be at your game Friday night. I'll be home studying my Bible, my Sabbath school lesson. But he said, I want you to go and immediately after the game, call me and tell me what it was like. Because he knew that, you know, he, I mean, I was not an Adventist at the time, but he was very smart because he wanted me to come home after the game, not go out with the guys. So immediately after the game, I I didn't have cell phones in those days. And I put my dime or quarter, whatever it was in the pay phone. And I called him and he said, Hey, that's so exciting. Come home and tell me about it. I came home and told him and he just sat and listened and asked questions. So he had that balance of standing firm for Christ and principle, but reaching out to a wayward son and, um, it was that influence. We worked together when I was 17 because dad, by that time, had a factory and I was working in his factory. And um, he shared with me because he knew I was going to go off to college. And that just broke my heart. And the Adventist message made so much sense to me. Mm-hmm. And it gave so much peace and hope that um, I became the Seventh day Adventist. Wow. I just, your example, I think we're, we're living in a world now and, and especially, I mean, it's been like this in the past as well. But I find that there's so much pressure on all of society. And I think it, sometimes it trickles into our church experience as well, whereas people that are meant to reach out to others, we feel this compelling um, pressure and, and this push to minister with, with haste, but without real recognition of the needs of others in that time. And you, you've shared a story here that's obviously impacted your entire life um, and your approach as well. Um, and when you were when you were sharing about your um, your grandmother and, and your mum's experience um, in my own loss, I lost my mother a couple of years ago, and just knowing that piece about where she was and and what was going on for her, which which turns out to be nothing because she's resting, was such a beautiful. You know, you've you've referred to this peace and this hope um, and this assurance, um, and that's something that's really special that your dad was as you said, was able to share in a, in a really important time. I wanted to ask you, because you're stepping now, obviously your dad's been um, ministering to you as, as a father, but also um, sharing truth as you did with your mum. When did you first feel or sense a call to ministry uh, and what did that look like? For me, it was no flash of light. It was no um, overwhelming um, um, time of, you know, I just sensed and saw that uh, this was it. I think the difference between an impulse and impression is this. An impulse is something that's flighty. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. An impression is a growing constant awareness that God wants you to do something that you could do nothing else. And so at the end of my senior year in high school, I began to sense the leading of God to ministry. I began to sense that the Holy Spirit was moving in my life, but that didn't happen overnight. It was a period of weeks, a period of months, and um, the impression became, became deeper. And it was at a point, Ruth, where I could do nothing else. And I have counseled many young men or young ladies who want to go into God's work. And I have said to them, if you can do anything else, do it. The call to ministry (laughs) is a life call and it's a life commitment. Um, Take your time, think about this, pray about it. 
and let God impress you because it's a commitment of service for the rest of your life. And it was a conviction for me that took place over a period of time, not a, um, not a flighty impulse. Mm. Did you ever feel as though you felt that yes, God was leading you, but you yourself were hesitant or did you feel like you actually wanted to make that jump? I I don't think I was hesitant. I was uncertain. And I think there's a difference. Mm. Um, It wasn't, Mm. I was, I was not sure at initially. And, uh, you know, I think there are really four aspects of guidance. First you pray and you listen to the voice of the spirit in your life. Mm. You study the word of God and see if there's anything in the Bible that helps to guide you for your decision. Thirdly, you counsel with others. And so I began to counsel with others and ask them, what do you think? And fourthly, you look for the open doors of providence and what, how is God working? Somebody said wisdom is finding out which way God is moving and moving with him. And so for me, the, the most convincing things in this particular decision to go into ministry were one, the deep conviction God was giving me, and two, people that I trusted, that I counseled with, said that they really encouraged me in that area. Mm. Is there somebody that stands out to you, maybe an example of a pastor or or an evangelist, um, that you felt really spoke into your life in that season? Um, At that particular time, uh, now I've had many mentors since then, but at that particular time, Mm. The pastor that baptized me, Pastor Marion Kidder, was always a real blessing to me. Um, I had a mm-hmm. pastor who I got to know as well, who was pastoring. I was living in Connecticut. He was pastoring in Hartford, Connecticut. His name was O.J. Mills, and he was a real influence in my life. So those two men were very positive influences my, in my life early in those days. And then later, Pastor Ron Halverson became the pastor of our local church, and he was an influence. So early in my ministry, those three men were really a powerful influence. Mm, that's beautiful. So when people talk about ministry, um, I know we have Avondale College here in Australia and as an undergraduate degree, um, young men and women can go in or men and women of any age can go in and study um, theology and ministry and chaplaincy. But what I know, notice about you is that you've stepped quite heavily into evangelism or I guess quite a public figure um, in a sense for our church. How did that come about? How did you, was there a transition time? How did that Mm -hmm. occur? Uh, Ruth, I was pastoring uh, for a number of years, smaller churches, and then some that were a little bigger, and uh, working at a very small supporting ministry school through the conference in the South, a school called Wildwood. I was an employee of the conference, and I was there at the school teaching some Mm -hmm. evangelism. And I had held a couple of evangelistic meetings in that area, and sensed that God was leading me into full-time evangelism. And my wife and I, and again, I don't want to suggest that God always works this way, but he did with us. I came home one night and talked to my wife, Teeny, about it. And I said, you know, I think God is leading us to evangelism. I'm really, I was holding meetings in a tent and then holding meetings in a small <clears throat> auditorium. I was young. <clears throat> and um, as I uh, talked to Teeny about it, we prayed and we just earnestly prayed that night. Now, again, I don't want to give the impression that this always happens, but the next day I got a call from the ministerial secretary of the Southern New England Conference in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island area. And he said to me, we were in our office yesterday thinking about a new conference evangelists and your name came into our mind. Would you be interested? And I, after my prayer experience that night and that experience, and I said to him, you know, I, I really believe God is leading us, but I have certain conditions because I recognized even back then that society was moving toward a more secular postmodern society. So most American evangelists at that point were doing like three weeks of evangelistic meetings or four. And I wanted to look at a different model, a model where we came mm-hmm. in cities and spent three months, six months in those cities a model where we worked with church members in prayer and Bible studies, and a model where we reached out in a multifaceted approach with stress management classes and natural lifestyle cooking and uh, exercise classes and family life. And, and also I wanted to work in a model where I worked with a team of young people and that I would recruit them. And so 
the conference was excited about that model. So I went into evangelism there in Southern New England and uh, worked there, then went from there to, um, to the Chicago area to work with Andrews University and uh, to train in evangelism while we did evangelism in the Master Divinity Program. And then went, of course, to Europe and uh, had an opportunity to work in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, England. I was a minister of secretary of the Trans-European Division and worked in uh, socialist countries, uh, Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, then later Russia. And then at that point went to It Is Written and began to hold a lot of satellite evangelistic meetings. And then in 2000, mm -hmm. the General Conference. And uh, so I've been at the General Conference now for almost 17 years. It's just amazing how mm -hmm. it goes. And in a sense, there is evangelism. Um, I mean, ministry, you know, when I asked earlier, when did you sense that call of minist to ministry? Um, we tend to think of it as that small box of ministering to a small small or large church or a community and, and moving around every four or five years, um, depending on where you are. Um, but ministry can be so much more. We can be, I could be talking to somebody right now that is ministered in Papua New Guinea doing missionary work. Um, or for your, for your example, you know, having done so many different things, but with what seems to me is this deep love for people and um, just a recognition of where they seem to be at and their needs at the time. Um, you've mentioned things like the, the cooking classes or family dynamics and assisting people with the actual perceived needs that they have um, first and then being able to bring the gospel to them. Uh, which sounds a lot to me like Christ's method alone. Yeah, you know, I love that statement in Ministry of Healing. Christ's method alone will bring mm -hmm. success in reaching the people. You know, he ministered among men. We um, have followed that method. Um, we believe that as you meet the felt needs of people, you uh, their hearts open for you to meet their deeper spiritual needs. We don't meet the felt needs as a method to manipulate them. We meet their felt needs because we care for them, we're interested in them, we love them, and uh, because Christ created them in his image. But as you meet the felt needs of people, God opens the door, he opens hearts, he opens minds for the uh, sharing of the gospel. And we have seen this so many times um, here. Uh, when Tini and I um, were going to retire in 2010, which we have not done yet. Uh, <laughs> the church books may say I'm retired, but I think I'm working more now <laughs> than we did before. But we moved out into an area that had no Seventh-day Adventist church. It had, um, mm -hmm. it's a gated community, has a couple of golf courses, and we live in a little retirement section of that, but they have some very well-to-do homes. Many people who work for the government in Washington, D.C. live in our area, and it had no church in our immediate community. Uh, there was a little church about, oh, 15, 20 minutes away. And um, we went to that little 40 member church and then began working here. We've now built a beautiful church, a facility where we have our church. We have a Living Hope School of Evangelism. We have a nice church of when before COVID 180, 200 people come each Sabbath and many young professionals. Uh, this last Sabbath, mm -hmm. five couples in the church that were not Seventh-day Adventists, but all professional couples were studying. But the interesting thing is we've had between seven and 900 non-Seventh-day Adventist visitors come to our church, Ruth, in the last um, four years, between seven and 900. Um, mm. COVID on Monday nights regularly, we'd have health programs. We'd have um, stress management, exercise classes, wellness classes, cooking classes. Tuesday nights, we had a Bible class and uh, that people came to. So. We have an ongoing outreach into the community. At Christmas, we have all kinds of Christmas programs that we run, concerts, and, and invite people to come in for maybe herbal teas and some little homemade cookies and come to Christmas programs. So the whole philosophy is you win a friend, then you win a Christian friend, then you win a Seventh-day Adventist Christian friend. But we try to build as many relationships in the community as we possibly can so that the community mm -hmm. becomes aware of who we are and what we're doing. And mm -hmm. the essence of evangelism is not friendship alone, but neither is it proclamation alone. A lot of people say, mm -hmm. well, make friends. Well, no, I can make friends on the golf course. I can make friends at a bowling alley. I can make friends in a variety of places. But there comes a point mm -hmm. 
where you share Jesus. There comes a point where you open the Bible and study with them. And so our life is wrapped up with people. Jesus was wrapped up with people. The reason for programs is not for program's sake, but it's for people's sake. So even now, in the busyness of our lives, with everything we're doing, we have a school of evangelism here. We have a um, media ministry. We have a pastor's retreat center that we just bought. That's about seven minutes from church where pastors come for retreats. But with all of that, we still give Bible studies. I mean, I have each Monday night, I have marriage counseling that I do. And so we're interested, our lives are wrapped up in people. We believe that Christ died for people and that's what we're interested in. Mm. And it's, it's been uh, something that's on, been on my heart a lot as a deep side is there. Um, just about the fact that a lot of us talk about um, ministering to the needs of secular people, but we have sometimes quite a, narrow perception of what that means um and you've you've shared that there's a community that you you dwell in and that you spend time with that on the outside of things seems to not really need help in life so to speak but you've been able to step in and say well you know there's things like loneliness or there's things like past hurts or there's things like marriage struggles that um you can deeply minister to and it sounds like it's not only been a blessing for your community but also for you, I mean, you've stepped into that since retiring, <laughs> um, which is, in, you know, a, an incredible statement of, um, I guess, your faithfulness, but also the passion that Jesus has in your life and how that's reflected for you. You know, Ruth, I think one has to evaluate their community. If we were in an inner city community, I would probably run a food bank. I'd probably run mm-hmm. a very extensive program to... Uh, be sure people had closed. We might run an after school uh, program for um, children who need tutorial help and extra help with math. I might run a computer class. So that would be quite, I might run a job skills program. In the community we live, it's a very upmarket community. What people are interested in here, we looked, we took a look at a demographic study when we first came. They're interested in family, they're interested in their health and they are interested in moral, spiritual values. They may not Mm. be interested in studying the Bible, but they are interested in ethical, moral values. So we concentrated in those three areas based on the community that we live in. Mm. Yeah, and that's so important. I mean, it sounds like you've lived and and ministered to such a multitude of communities. I mean, you mentioned earlier as well that you spent some time actually mentoring and working with young people in Andrews University. Um, how was that experience for you? I love it. We do it today. Um, so yeah. now today, we, you know, I was at Chicago for six years from 1979 um, to 1985 before going to Europe. And so we taught then Master of Divinity students. But when I went to Europe, we'd always have long-term field schools of evangelism, three months, six months, where young people were with us. Early in our ministry, we had a lot of young people living in our home. I would have my own family and six, seven young people in our home at one time. Um, now we have our school of evangelism here. And we, it's, the way it works is we have a five-day intensive symposium. It starts on a Sunday night, goes to a Thursday night. Typically, we do that seven times a year. So we've had 200 pastors come to us from the Sunday night to the Thursday night. In addition to that, we now have a pastor's retreat center. We can take, we can sleep 13. It's beautiful. It's like a five-star hotel. We have two saunas. We have um, a jacuzzi. We have a cold tub. We have um, massage rooms, wonderful food. And so pastors come there and they spend time there getting physically, mentally, emotionally rejuvenated. And then we, we mentor them. We spend time with them. In addition to that, we Southern Adventist University. And they have a master's degree program. Their students can take nine hours of academic credit with us. They, so in the summertime for two weeks, they send their students. We're working with another supporting ministry called Heartland College, and uh, they bring their students to us as well. So what, uh, what our whole goal is, even now, is work with a lot of young people. We have young people on our team now. I have one, two, three, 
uh, young people. We rent a apartment for them. And uh, then they work on our, most of them are working on our media ministry team because our media ministry has just exploded now. Um, mm. It's uh, some of our video, some of my DVDs now, they will be on YouTube. You'll 500,000, 600,000, 800,000 views, many of them 100,000. Mm. Just did one last week. And I think I looked at it this morning it was 107,000 views. So um we are really working hard on digital media and um, that's an area. We also have a university in our university. We have 150 courses. It's an online university. We have 150 courses and our students are taking about 25,000, 26,000 classes now. Um, much of what we do is all tuition free. We do charge a little bit for its classes in our university. Uh, many of them are free, but some are charged a little bit. But when pastors come to us, like from Sunday to Thursday, we don't charge anything. We just say, you come, mm. if they want to eat, they, they pay a little bit for the meals, but that's it. At our retreat center, we don't charge anything. We provide everything for them. And um, mm. we just tell them, if you want to make a donation, you can do that. And we do better that way. We do better that way. Mm. Have people coming uh, and then they just get so excited about the ministry that they say, look, what can we do for you? So when we find what well, we, Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So when we give, people say, how do you run this operation? You know, it's a huge operation. How do you do this with no subsidy from the church? We don't get one penny from the church's subsidy. How do you do this? And I tell them, when you give, it's a residual effect. Uh, it says, She'll be pressed down and run over, you know. So we believe that God is in it and he's able to take care of it. Mm, and I think as well, you know, how it says in the story of Abraham, it, it was he was blessed to be a blessing. And, and we experience um, both God's blessing to us so that we can bless others, but also the blessing of actually being a blessing to others. And when people are so thankful to us for what we do, I always step back and say, no, you know, thank you. Um, which exactly. seems to be the case for you. You seem to have such a, you know, we're talking about calm and peace and hope and you seem, the, the Australian word, I don't know if it's really stated much in America around the world, but we say that we just seem stoked or <laughs> um, <laughs> ex I guess excited or, or delighted. I'll look that one up in Webster's Dictionary. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I don't know how it's going to go. <laughs> um, but, yeah, we definitely use, it, um, use that statement. I wanted to like shift just a little bit because we'd, we've been talking about ministering to, I guess, a community that you, you're dwelling in. And you've also mentioned that you worked in, um, you know, socialist countries and things like that. Now, when I first became a, um, a Christian again as an adult, it was about five years ago, um, and we were doing this mock trial in, um, in a church in England, um, pretending that we were on trial for being Adventist. And they were testing, I guess, it was, it was fun, um, testing our knowledge in, in scripture and understanding. And some of the students at the back were whipping out this little red book called Studying Together. Right. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. You know, you've, you've published this guide on connecting with people from other faiths and perspectives. Um, and it's widely used in the church. There, there was at one point, I think, an app. Um, what do you find the most challenging when it, when it comes to reaching people um, from other religions or just, yeah, other perspectives? If I, let's suppose you were a Muslim or a Hindu, and I approached you and I said, Ruth, um, let me tell you about Christianity. You may put up your hands, but once you learn I am a Seventh-day Adventist, if you are a Muslim, and I say to you, Ruth, let me share some wonderful things that we have in common. Tell me the things that are important to you. And you say to me, well, one thing that is important is praying five times a day. And I say to you, you know, prayer is very important to me as well. Um, mm. Say to me, it's very important to, um, to, to keep my body, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't... Uh, use alcohol. I don't, I don't eat pork. I say, you know, that's a wonderful thing. Neither do we. One of the things I think that many people make a mistake in is they start with not, they don't have in common with others rather than starting with things that they do have in common. Mm. Our little book studying together, 
I start each chapter on varying religions by these are the things we have in common. These are the mm-hmm. differences and these are approaches. So I think you start always where you can agree, not when you, where you can't, where, where you disagree. Um, mm-hmm. If somebody says to me, if I'm dealing with, for example, a Baptist and they say, you know, my grandmother just died and I'm so thankful she's in heaven looking down at me. What is my comment to them is my comment is, let me straighten you out about where your grandmother is. <laughs> I say to them is, what a hope we have in Jesus. What a hope we have in mm-hmm. Jesus. I don't, you don't always have to correct people. So I find that when we're dealing with people of other religions, I want to get to know them as individuals. I want to understand what they believe so I can have a strategy kindly to share Christ with them. Mm. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people that sincerely would take a different approach to what you've shared. You know, you made the example and I I giggled there for a moment. It was probably more than a giggle Um, because I've seen it so commonly happen when somebody does pass away. I've got a friend who's um, who's um, has family and their grandmother has passed away. And a similar thing came up, the exact same conversation over dinner. And I just sat there nodding. Um, without saying anything because the the person that is sitting across from you and Mark, you've kind of shared this, we, we share what's in common and what's in common, for instance, in that example is that we have a hope that we get to see our loved ones again. Exactly. Um, and when, you know, that, that book itself has been very helpful for me because I, I, I came and I had an experience when I first came back to the church um, where, where I was around um a culture of legalism that I think it came, it comes from fear. There's this fear of this pressure to quickly, you know, convert and um, this fear of, you know, losing people that are important to God. And it's not necessarily out of aggression or frustration, but yeah, we do sometimes step ahead. Um, and so this approach that you're talking of, of um, sharing what's in common seems to be um yeah, it, it calms both the person that's that we're ministering with, but also our own our own hearts, and allows us to experience that patience that stems from God. Mm-hmm. I call it earning the right to be heard, developing. Mm-hmm. A trust. So, if I'm meeting with a Hindu or Muslim, or a person who is of not is a Christian but not Adventist persuasion, if we can focus on what is common. If I can build a bond of trust, I earn the right to be heard. Then Mm. comes a point in the conversation, not in that immediate conversation, but in the friendship over a period of weeks, months, could be longer, where I might say to them, um, may I share with you another perspective on that? I love the may Mm. principle because you respect the person's freedom of choice. May I share with you Um, what the Bible says about that topic, what the ancient scriptures say. Um, It may be helpful. And so I try to bring people to a point where they are open and receptive to hear biblical passages of truth without offending them. Now, some people you're going to offend. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's no way not. Jesus offended some people. They don't like it. Some of the religious leaders of his day, he offended them so much they wanted Mm -hmm. to... Him, you know, so you are going to offend some people. So I'm not concerned that I offend them. I'm concerned that I offend them because of my tactlessness and my mm. my attempt to put pressure on them. Um, if they're yeah. offended after I have gently sh- shared with them at the right time, that's a different issue. Mm. Yeah, and it sounds like you're stemming from a place of. Um, of love and respect for the journey that they've been on to even hold those perspectives in the first place. You know, we have no idea why the backgrounds, I mean, I had no idea and maybe I should, um, but I didn't know that you grew up as a Catholic. And so, um, and neither did I assume at the same time that, you know, that you grew up as an Adventist. And so we all have these journeys and these stories. And I guess these, this is what this interview and, and conversations in general should be about is getting to know, one another and being able to journey together, even if just for a brief moment as well. Right. Um, you spend a lot of time with people. You were mentioning that um, you would have your family and then seven other students at a time, sometimes, you know, living with you. 
How do you like to spend time when you're on your own, when you finally get that downtime? Um, I have a lot of things that I love to do. Um, nature is a um, very, I'm very fond of nature. So uh, I love, we live in a place where I can go out and walk on the trails. I was out this morning. And uh, so when I have downtime, nature is something I enjoy. I enjoy the beach. I've always enjoyed the beach. If it's quiet, I don't go to crowded beaches, don't like them at all. But there are places I can go and to swim. I enjoy that very much. Um, I enjoy riding my bike. Love that. Uh, there was a time in my life uh, that I'd enjoyed playing golf. Um, so, yeah, we have many different things that we do. I would say outdoor activities, hiking. Mm -hmm. uh, we just love hiking. If we can go to the mountains and hike, uh, um, tri uh, uh, biking, riding our bikes, uh, and uh, when you have grandkids, you stay young. And so we <laughs> very much. So yeah, those outdoor activities are some, and we like gardening. Yeah, very much so. We mm -hmm. had a garden last year and we, if we can spend time in our garden, we certainly do that. Yeah, and it sounds like such a good antidote to, um, I mean, you would know doing, doing so much work in, in digital ministry and, and being in, um, you know, artificial light and that kind of thing, even in, in days past of evangelistic series. And it's just nice to step back into what God has created rather than what man is, you know, putting together in a lot of senses. So exactly. I can see that brings real joy to you. Yeah. <laughs> and is there anything else that you feel that you're passionate about other than ministry, maybe a special hobby or, you know, you've mentioned bike riding and golfing. Mm. I would say um, reading. I love to read and uh, constantly every day reading. I'm reading through the Conflict of the Ages series now, uh, just for my own personal enjoyment. And this year already I've read uh, mm -hmm. The Patriarchs and Prophets. I'm almost through Prophets and Kings. I've read Desire of Ages. So the first six months of the year, I'll read uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, uh, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostle, Great Controversy. Um, so reading is something I really enjoy and broadly reading, um, reading about uh, the political situation, reading about history, reading about culture, background, peoples. So um, I would say that's one of the things that uh, when I relax, I love to read if I'm not outdoors doing things uh, outside. So yeah, I, I, I really enjoy that. Um, I enjoy very much staying abreast with what my children are interested in. I have three children and uh, just plug into them. Like I talked to all three of them yesterday. And so we're always on the phone sharing my grandkids, um, my granddaughter FaceTime with us last night. And so mm -hmm. I say that what gives me the greatest joy in life is interacting with my family, interacting with my friends. The other thing that I enjoy, I think before COVID, of course, was travel. Almost every mm -hmm. year, I guided tours to the Reformation, to the Middle East, to the uh, land, to Turkey, Area 7 churches, to, the, to Britain, and uh, so English Reformation, uh, uh, European Central Reformation, Luther's time, Bible lands, Israel, uh, um, seven churches, Island of Patmos. So there are groups that I've taken, and I, re that's, I look back, and that's something, Ruth, I really, really enjoy just uh, mm. the background of it, the history, the culture of it, and very, very much so. Yeah, um, and I know those places, um, I mean, there's, you know, the lineage journey, a friend of mine was involved in that, um, in that ministry, kind of recording some of the, the locations for the seven churches. Um, is, there, is there a particular place, I guess, a modern culture, because we can't really step back in time, um, you know, 2000 years back and see the legitimate culture of those places. But traveling around those areas, is there a culture or place in particular that um, you really appreciate or value? I would say there are a few. Um, I lived in England for five years and St. Albans, anytime I can go to St. Albans, that little town where the <laughs> division is just very, very special to me. It's a very, very special mm -hmm. of that. Um, I love Greek culture. Um, we've had a number of tours to Greece and I just really enjoy it. Um, in South America, Brazil, oh, it's just active and a lot yeah. and vibrant and it's a Brazilian culture. So it's hard for me. Uh, Africa, I've always enjoyed Africa as well. When I look, I guess I would put it this way. 
I enjoy the places the most where I am. Um, if I'm in the Philippines, I love it. Indonesia, China, you know, I just look back over it. And, uh, but I would say of all those places, probably St. Albans, England is my, it's just a special place to me. Mm. Yeah, England was, was actually the place that I came back to the faith. And um, there's something very, you know, you're talking about small towns and small villages and the winding roads and yeah. the clear seasons, I guess, um, for me as an Australian, very clear seasons was really special. Um, but yeah, even just, I find, you know, you're mentioning going to the Philippines, even the simple act for me of going to a shop and seeing how they set out their aisles and, um, you know, the, the labeling and packaging on their grocery items is speaks so much of a culture in a lot of ways. Uh, so I've got a question here um, and these questions are, you know, we, you know, you and I are having this conversation, but it also comes from, um, uh, you know, different community members as well. And one of them is that, and you were mentioning books as well. Um, you have, according to Wikipedia, um, you've published over 74 books. Now, do you ever check a Wikipedia page that, you know, some people Google themselves, Mark. Are you a vain person? Have you? <laughs> I don't, this, I don't Google a... myself very much. <laughs> Um, is, is 74 books, you know, in the ballpark of how much you... It written? is, it is. It could be more now. That could be... Yeah. But, um, and I'll tell you how that happens. A lot, a lot of the questions, mm. you, people say, how in the world do you ever write 74 books? Well, yes. this, this is the way it happens. First, mm. I'm old enough, I'm 50, so I, I've been in ministry 53 years. So when you're in 53 years, you better have something back <laughs> Yeah. So, so if I live to a hundred, you know, I will, uh, you know, I will, I will have even more. But seriously, the way I do it is this: I um, just wrote a book, "Hope for Troubled Times." It's on the pandemic. So, for example, here are some of the chapters. The ultimate vaccine is one chapter, and mm. I talk about vaccines. That I talk about Christ is the ultimate vaccine for sin. PPE, personal protective equipment, and the best for the Christian is prayer, Bible study, etc. Then another chapter is how to deal with worry, fear, and anxiety. Another one is um, on pandemics, pro pandemics, pestilences, and prophecy. So uh, I'll tell you the story on that. The General Conference called me March, I think it was last year. They said, Mark, we need a new book, Hope for Troubled Time. We need a book on the pandemic, the COVID-19. But we need this in about six weeks because of the translations around the world. Can you write a book in six weeks? Well, here's the point. It was easy for me. And the reason it was easy for mm. me is I was preaching those sermons. And I preach manuscript sermons. So every one of my sermons is about 3,500 words to 3,800 mm. words. So, And I, I, I don't preach out of an outline. I write everything out of manuscript. And it takes me about 15 hours to prepare a sermon. So I already had of the, say, whatever, I forget the number of chapters, but say there's 10, 13 chapters in the book. I already had like nine or 10 of them written because they were my manuscript mm -hmm. I've been preaching. So somebody calls me and says, Mark, we need a new book on the second coming of Christ. I look back over a hundred sermons and pull eight sermons that are already manuscript on the second coming of Christ, refine them. We need something on grace. I look back. So every week that I preach, I am writing a new chapter of a book. So that's how I'm able to do it because I, I take advantage of the time that I'm using to prepare a sermon to make that a chapter of a book. Then you can shorten it, you can lengthen it, et cetera. So that's, that's the secret of that. Ah, no, it's, you know, it's actually so smart. I remember um, last year during COVID, in fact, um, I was asked to um, preach for my church plant and we had to do it via Zoom as well. Um, and I remember writing this out and because, because I was staring straight at the screen, I just, I had the, um, the manuscript, as, as you said, just there, but I reflected and realized that it's, it's good content for an article or yeah. um, like a devotional thought or something. So, oh, you've made it so much easier for me now. I'm, I'm looking at writing my first book. So Great. Yeah, maybe That's maybe exciting. 74 books later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't right. know if I'll get time with the way that the, the world's going, but um, you, yeah, you've mentioned the Hope for Troubled Time, and I know that there's also videos available for that um, on the Seventh-day Adventist Church YouTube channel, which is awesome. Um, and 
it seems like, you know, you mentioned that you were meant to retire in 2010, but, you know, you and Tini just keep going, keep going. Why aren't you kicking back and just stepping into Adventism to retire, you know, whatever the retirement version is of Adventism? I, th I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, we do take time. We, we, in, we do, you know, when you get older, you don't have the energy you had when you're younger. And I noticed that, but we continue to minister and we minister. I think our ministry right now is as broad as it ever has been because we can use digital ministry. We can use a variety of other th mm. things as well. So, um, but there's something within us. There's a passion within us. I feel that if I were doing nothing for Christ and simply uh, tried to retire and put my feet in the ocean water and sat there week after week. Now, occasionally it's not too bad to tell you the truth. But, yeah, sounds really nice. <laughs> but um, if, if I didn't do anything, I think that would be my death now. Um, for mm. me, activity is really important. And, uh, and, but again, we do have to cut back. We can't, you, you don't have the energy at 75, 76 that you do when you're 40. So we try to live a more balanced life, spend time certainly with our children and grandchildren, but we try to maximize our time. So for example, let's suppose I'm preaching on Sabbath. One, I've written a manuscript, so it's going to be a chapter in a book. Two, I preach to my local congregation. Three, we put that live that particular day that I'm preaching. So last Sabbath, I preached a sermon on the resurrection because it was, a, it was Easter. 10,000 people watched it immediately. So then mm -hmm. take that. I can also, um, the next Sunday, take that same material, sit in a webinar, and then that webinar becomes a class which we put on our university site. So what I'm trying to do now, Ruth, is maximize what I do to make what I do more reaching, more important, not more, mm. more far reaching than simply um, having to work seven days a week uh, indefatigably or six days and take one day off. Now, <laughs> although I try to step back and relax some, I try to focus and I ask myself, how can I maximize my energies so that it has a greater impact for Christ? Yeah, it sounds like you're working smarter rather than harder which is a lesson that all of us need to learn because obviously Jesus took time off and um, you know he had a limited amount of time in ministry but even now is still ministering just in a different way to how how he was when he was spending those three and a half years um, deep in the trenches in a sense um, so you've got the book the series which just went live, you're you're preaching every well every weekend or so, or ministering through this through this school. Um, is there anything else that um, you haven't mentioned to us yet that you're working on, or like maybe considering that you'll venture into in the future? Right. I want to clarify. I don't pastor our church, so I don't preach every. Oh week. right. Yeah. We do have a yeah. pastor who works there. A couple of things. Yeah. I'm really excited about. I'm working on a project called The Three Cosmic Messages, which um, is uh, just wrote a book on the three angels' messages, and I've just wrote 13 sermons. I think, and pastors are using those now. Uh, people can go mm -hmm. on a site called threecosmicmessages.com. They can download the sermons, download the graphics. We think that they're some of the latest graphics. Then also, um, my sister is an educator. She did a doctorate at Boston University. She um, has taught for many years. She's been principal of admin schools. She joined us, a small team I'm working with, about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, she had been the principal of a particular school. And um, she's taught both in secular universities and Adventist, and her specialty is curriculum development. She has developed a curriculum from the kindergarten children to the high school children um, wow. are the three angels messages. It's a two week curriculum. It has teacher's guides. It has um, books appropriate for each age. There's multiple books in the series. There's videos, there's interactivity. And so we're really excited about that project. We, we, we really believe that the essence of Adventism has to do with Revelation 14, rightly understood, 
And uh, many people think it's mystic symbols and cryptic images and beasts, but they don't see Jesus in it. And so we really, with a whole team of us, uh, worked on that. And we're really excited about that project. That's one thing we're excited about. We're excited about expanding our, our internet presence um, and our YouTube presence. We think that that has real, real potential. And uh, although I don't preach every week, I do try to do a new um, YouTube program every week. And so we're really encouraged about that. Our pastor's retreat center is just coming into its own. We've only had it for a year, but that mm -hmm think has real potential for the future because many pastors are tired, they're worn out. They want to come to a place where they can get counsel guidance and they can rest and get some good food. And so we um, were encouraged about that. There's so many things, Ruth, that we're encouraged about. Mm. Here's, a, here's a question that's kind of related to that. Um, and it's kind of just popped into my mind, you know, um, I have like a deep, so my background is that I do counseling um, and so observing as, as I, as I do get to travel, um, I guess within Australia and, and visit different churches as well, I see a lot of pastors that are, um, that are working really hard and, and contributing in a lot of ways to their local church and to ministry as well. What is your suggestion for pastors or ministers or evangel evangelists, um, to avoid burning out or experiencing spiritual fatigue? I think there are a few things that immediately come to my mind. Um, the first is you become spiritually fatigued easier if your devotional life is weak. Mm -hmm. The stronger your devotional life, your Bible study and prayer life, the more you will be fueled by Christ to give. So what I would say to young pastors particularly is put emphasis on your personal spiritual devotional life. That's number one. Number two, you become more burned out when you are physically and emotionally fatigued. Put emphasis on exercise and a good diet, adequate sleep. So spiritual and physical health contribute to a lack of burnout. High stress jobs where you get up in the morning and you start running and I don't mean jogging, I mean running from one place to the other, will tend to burn you out more quickly. So prayer, Bible study, meditation. Secondly, um, is the physical aspects of um, your life, uh, getting adequate water, getting adequate rest, um, get good diet. But there is a, th a number of other elements. A third element is this. Many pastors see a dichotomy between ministry and family. So is this dichotomy where they are in ministry, but yet their family, they say, I feel so guilty because I'm spending this time in ministry, I'm not spending time with my family. If that is your view, you're always going to be, have, be conflicted. So, but if you have a different view, and that is that ministry is a team ministry. So even if a wife works outside of ministry, she's not employed by the church, which is most of the cases today, in the industrialized developed world, most pastors' wives will have some job. What I counsel pastors to do is this, sit down with your wife, find the area of her gifts and skills. If it's in cooking, let her be involved in the, encourage her to be involved in the church in using nutrition classes. If it's with children's ministry, encourage her to be involved in children's ministry. If it's hospitality, get, encourage her to be involved in greeting. In other words, husbands and wives discuss together each of their roles in the local congregation, and they navigate that. The same with children. We have young people, 13 years old, 14 years old, that we've taught to run camera. They have to be responsible, but some of them are great at doing it. They really take it responsibly. We have other young people that participate in a praise team and lead out in worship with us. So the whole concept is, particularly for pastors, is that you look like what our pastor's son, for example, is going to turn 13. Now, he is 13 now, and he's running camera. And he just comes to church every Sabbath. He just loves it, you know, the technology. So the idea is find a collaborative team ministry within your family. Um, the aspect is you tend to burn out more 
if ministry becomes problem-centered rather than mission-oriented. And that's, I think, a key point. If your ministry is problem-centered, if you're looking at all the problems at the church, you're going to burn out much more, much easier. But if mission is the top of your church board item, if outreach and what fuels you is seeing people come to Christ and uh, seeing them, um, seeing what God is doing and hearts converted. Uh, so here are four things. One, deep spirituality will keep you from burning out. Two, is adequate physical exercise and a good diet and rest. Three, sharing with your family your own heart, desire, and ministry and finding roles for each family member. And, and four, being central on mission. I think those things can be helpful to pastors. Yeah, and it sounds like it, those things that you and T have had and, and probably journeyed in and, and maybe mm. at some moments possibly even struggled with. Um, oh, sure. The nature sure. of two humans coming together. Right. Um, but it's such good guidance for young people that are at university and um, obviously meeting people of the opposite sex and um, exploring uh -huh. the idea of finding a life partner. And I think it's such a good question to ask, like how are we going to approach these four areas? How are we going to work as a team, as, as one flesh on this? Um, right. Look, this, this, this conversation has been such a blessing for me. Um, and I hope for you to be able to share just, just some of your, I guess your areas of understanding um, and to you know, share wisdom. I hope that's been a blessing for you, Mark, as well. Yes, it's been enjoyable. Just a very relaxing conversation. I really appreciate it, Ruth. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for, um, for sharing. And, and I just have a quick question as well. Um, if there's one, one last um, piece of advice that you can give for a young person starting out in this broad area called ministry, what would it be? I think if the one thing I could say to them is uh, you, we never give will succeed unless we give ourselves permission to fail, fail. Don't um, be too hard on yourself early, early in ministry. There's a something I call skill building. My first sermons were quite weak, but I was building a skill. I kept writing them, writing them. My first evangelistic, mm -hmm was in a tent. We didn't baptize anybody. Um, but I was learning, building a skill. First time I ever ran a stress management program, my knees were knocking. I was so stressed out to run that program, you know, but I was learning. Um, first programs I ever did with It Is Written Television, Pastor George Vandeman, couldn't use them. We had spent thousands of dollars on them. My programs are so poor, we couldn't use them. We had to throw them away but he got me a mentor in Hollywood who taught me how to do television. So as I look back over my ministry, when I'm talking to young people, don't be afraid to do something because you think you're gonna fail. The worst failure is you didn't do it. Always push yourself beyond. If you feel content in what you're able to do and capable of what you're able to do, you're not doing enough. Always take another step. I knew nothing about TV, took that step. Do nothing about satellite ministry, took that step. Knew very little about YouTube ministry. So I think what I say to young pastors is, don't be hard on yourself. The worst failure is the failure not to do. And you do it and you go over, do it again and again and again. And you let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you and strengthen you. And you build this skill. Then you build another skill and you build another skill. And pretty soon, the things that were hard for you become easier for you. And pretty soon you're able to have a broad-based ministry that touches thousands of lives for the kingdom. Yeah, that, that statement, don't be afraid to fail. Um, I think that just sums up everything so perfectly. For, no matter like what type of ministry, whether you are um, – you know, if you're working in medical ministry or you're a teacher or um, you're even just working in, you know, a nine to five job like an accountant or anything, I think that it's such a such a beautiful example of good advice, you know, that we can take um, as we work not for men but for God himself. 
Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Ruth.